Welcome to the On Point Podcast, a channel dedicated to helping you be the best hunter you can be. On Point is designed to help motivate and inspire you to get more out of yourself and your gear during your next hunt. If you're looking for information that will directly impact your success and help inspire you to go on new adventures, whether you're hunting with a bow or a rifle, On Point is the channel for you. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the podcast. This is the episode where I get to sit down with South Cox from Stalker Stick Bows and talk about big mule deer spot and stock. And for folks that don't know who South is, he, he makes his own traditional bows, uh, Stalker Stick Bows is his company, but he has an amazing track record of putting down these big bucks, open country spot and stock with his traditional bow. And I can't think of very many people that have probably a better track record than his. Um, he's definitely a guy that if you're wanting to get into the mule deer game, especially spot and stock with the bow, he's one that you want to listen to. So I have him on the show. I pick his brain. We learn about pretty much when, where, and how is he doing this consistently. And it just made for a great episode. It was over the internet, so it's not the high quality audio that you guys are used to. But it's def still definitely a lot of good information um, and, and definitely a good listen. So uh, I'll put all the notes uh, for his links and stuff in the show notes. So if you want to check him out, just check out the show notes. And uh, it made for a great episode. So leave me a review with a five star with a comment that will get you entered in these giveaways. Yes, that's practically a bribe. I'm totally cool with it. But, uh, you know, it's helping the podcast grow. We're getting a lot of good feedback. Um Pretty much just a review with a comment so I can see who left it. That gets you entered. So thanks, everybody, for the uh, for the downloads. I really appreciate it. This thing is growing great. And I look forward to hearing your guys' feedback on this one. So I'll see you at the end. Bye. So, well, what do you say we get this thing going then? That'll work. So, uh, well, you want to introduce yourself or I'd be happy to do it for you. I mean, I've been following your stuff for a long time. I've never got into the trad bows, but when I see you smack one of these big bucks with your trad bow at like, I don't know, 14 yards or whatever, it's kind of hard not to raise an eyebrow and really start looking in that direction because it's, that's just, just a whole different experience that I'm not getting with a compound bow shooting them at 40, 50, 60, 70 yards that you're getting. I mean, you're getting that way more intimate kind of hunt and, um, you know, it's just, it's just really what turned me on to talking to you because I have a huge passion for mule deer and uh, I, I'm just really excited to have you on the show, man. Right on. Well, I appreciate it. You know, I, I've got a long, actually longer history of shooting a compound than I do with the, uh, with the stick bow. And, um, you know, I've, was passionate about hunting mule deer the whole time I was hunting with my compound and, and honestly was a little bit anxious about, how shooting a trick uh, stick bow would translate over into you know being still you know being a successful hunter with uh with mule deer but um i just kind of you know adapted and and it is possible to get you know really close to mule deer um with a stick bow if you kind of stack the well in my what works for my techniques is that you know above timber line um, kind of alpine stuff and, and, uh, getting good broken country with a lot of micro topography. And so I'm somewhat of a specialist, um, you know, and the mule deer inhabit a lot of country, obviously from low desert country, you know, the badlands there in North and South Dakota and, um, you know, uh, more open stuff, um, you know, say in Eastern Colorado, but, if you take that high country, that alpine stuff, and, and you find bowls that aren't, you know, really smooth, large and smooth sided, if you get into some of that stuff that's more broken up, mm -hmm. that really, um, you know, makes a big difference when it comes to getting in close with the stick bow. Well, let's get into, let's get into the background first. I, sure. I really like getting to know guys um, background and getting to know them more on a personable level before we get into things. So you, you have your stalker stick bows. Yeah. You, um, you're on the Western, you have the Western bow hunter podcast. Yep. You come out with your own DVDs. Yeah. That, uh, so I'm working on editing on my second one right now. I think it was four or five years ago. We came out with the first one. And, uh, so yeah, this has been, a um, a long haul getting this last project together, but 
uh, hopefully, well, it, this will be the last DVD after this. We're just going to start putting stuff up on YouTube because it's just too big of a project to bite off all at once. Yeah, yeah. So basically, how long have you, I mean, you started off in Oregon though, didn't you? No, I lived, I grew up in Northern California, um, although you're right. I mean, I, I shot my first mule deer in Oregon in 1988, um, but I did start, you know, I, I lived my from birth to about a year and a half ago in northwestern California, up there, kind of you know, tucked away in the corner up there towards the Oregon border. Really? That's yeah. Because I've been um, been reaching out to a few guys trying to figure out this northern California hunting mule deer blacktail game. All right. Yeah, the mule deer. I mean, really, mule deer and blacktail both in California are just getting crushed by the um, the uh, bears and mountain lions and the fact that we haven't been able to hunt them for years there. Well, the, the bears we can, but they took dog hunting away three or four, well, four, maybe four or five years ago now. And consequently the bear population has exploded. It was already on an upward trend, but that didn't help it at all. How, how, how long ago did that happen? Um, I want to say it was probably, you know, around that four kind of four years ago kind of time frame, And every year, they would limit out on the quota of bears. And since the, the outlawed the bear hunting, they haven't limited, um, haven't reached the quota once. So really, it's, yeah, it's making a big, uh, you know, the, the bears are heavy in the fawn predation there. I don't think that they kill too many mature deer, but the fawn, re, the fawn recruitment has gone way down since then and, you know, continues to go down. Yeah, it's funny you say because I, I subscribed to a bear hunting magazine and they did a study and it's granted it's grizzly bears, but the amount of like, I think they followed, it was like 20 or no, it was like 12 grizzly bears or something like that. I'll have to go back and check it out and, and send you a link to the study or something, but they killed over 200 uh, calves. And three yeah, yeah, it's... It's unreal. And the unfortunate part, you know, with the, the bear dog hunting thing is there were a lot of hunters in Northern California. Well, California period. Obviously, there's a lot of anti and non hunters in California. But then you take a huge segment of the hunting population, the hunters that weren't kind of putting that two and two together. And they, you know, they didn't hunt bears with dogs themselves. And they're like, ah, you know, who cares if you can't hunt them with dogs, not realizing the impact that you know, losing that, um, that bear hunting with dogs opportunity was going to imp how that was going to impact the deer. And so consequently, you know, it, it got shoved through and, and, uh, you know, now it's affecting their deer hunting that they hold deer, you know, to their hearts. Right. Right. And we kind of have that same problem in Oregon. I mean, mm -hmm. what, 1994, you know, yeah. no more dog hunting. There's bears everywhere. I mean, right. it's crazy. Makes for good bear hunting though. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. I mean, it, but the, you know, the, the thing is with bears is that at least you have half a chance at shooting them with a, you know, spot and stock or whatever. I mean, you guys lost bait hunting too, as I'm, if I'm not mistaken and spring bear. No, no, you have spring bear. You're wanting to turn uh, uh, South or Western Oregon spring bear into controlled hunt now. So. Cause uh, you guys don't have enough bears. So <laughs> in Southwest Oregon, give me I a break. Know, and I, I'm on the fence about that one. I've heard arguments on both sides of it and it's like, yeah, but at the same time, you know, maybe we should go to a quota because we're not filling the quota anyways. And right. I, I, I mean, don't know. Yeah. It seems like they should just make those tags kind of, you know, basically over the counter and then yes, maybe put a quota in place. Cause you're not, you know, if you're not hitting the quota, but as I understand, if you, put in for that Eastern bear hunt there in, in, uh, um, Oregon, then you can't get a, uh, a Southwestern tag, right? Uh, for spring. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. So, and, and you can't get a preference point if you, if you get Southwest spring or the, the Western spring. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't understand the, the psychology or the reasoning behind that one. I mean, they need to be encouraging bear harvest, not discouraging it with a growing population there. Absolutely. I mean, we, Two years ago, this spring, we, I didn't do very good. Last spring, I did really well finding the bears. We shot um, four bears out of one tiny little pocket. Four bears. Wow. Like, Holy cow. Looks, yeah, and and there's more bears in there this year. But, you know, I mean, that's uh, that's just an uphill battle that we're having to fight. I mean, the predator, I don't know what it is, but people and predators, but they're like sacred. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, people don't understand it. I mean, it's it's too much Disney effect there. 
Exactly. Exactly. Well, let's dive into um, to to your background on on hunting. Did you grow up hunting? Did your family grow up hunting? Or no. You- I, ironically, uh, my mom was a vegetarian when really? I was growing up. So yeah, I mean, I was uh, obviously didn't subscribe to that train of thought. And I remember at five years old, I I found my first. Uh, I found a bow under my neighbor's house. It was an old wood <laughs> recurve, and and man, I was hell bent to be a hunter. And so I you know, got my mom to go down and get me some arrows at the hardware store. And I was, you know, trying my best to go out there. And of course there's nothing, there's no danger of anything there, but I mean, my hunting instincts were deep and I don't know, I don't know where that came from because nobody in my family hunts or hunted. And uh, so I, I picked that one up all on my own and, and carried an interest in archery, you know, through my whole life. And I mean, I was really interested in guns as well, but my dad wouldn't let me have a gun. And so um, you know, the bow wasn't an issue, but um, I got a 22 rifle, I think, when I was maybe 12. And I had some BB guns before that and, yeah. and raised, you know, raised heck with the quail and, and all that. But even then, it was marginally successful. And uh, it wasn't until uh, – it was pretty funny. I was telling a friend of mine uh, this the other day. So when I was 13, I got my first compound. And here's how – you know, we we're talking about the the amount of information that's available for hunters now versus, um, you know, or archers or whatever. It, the barrier of entry is a lot lower. Mm-hmm. So when I was 13, I got my first compound and I thought that you could pull back any of the three strings and it would be a different draw weight on each string. You know, so I mean, this was my level of understanding. But uh, somehow, I mean, I, I got super lucky. The bow was an appropriate draw weight and draw length, really? both. Yeah, just by sheer luck. And uh, so that that kind of started me down the path of shooting a compound. And you know, I think when I was sixteen, or, no, seventeen, I shot my first buck and uh, a little fork and horn blacktail, and mm-hmm. that of course hooked me. And then the following year, I was successful again um, on blacktail, and then. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1987 and moved down to Santa Rosa, which is about an hour north of San Francisco, and walked into an archery shop that fall and um, saw Larry Jones, his uh, VHS video, Hunting Open Country Mule Deer, and sat down and just was like, you know, jaw drop. Uh, I was just blown away. I mean, I was, of course, I was aware of mule deer hunting. I consumed every hunting magazine I could get my hands on. and but that, that uh, you know, alpine hunting uh, mule deer above timberline, and I was just, I was hooked. I had to do it. And so the next year, I, I got my first out-of-state, you know, mule deer tag, went up to Oregon, and uh, was fortunate and, and able to shoot a buck on my first trip. Huh. That's insane. That's just that little VHS yep. is what kind of made you into the, the spot and stock monster yard today, huh? Yeah, you know, and to, to, to fast forward way ahead, um, I got a call this spring from Larry Jones, and and uh, he had uh, six points in Nevada, and I had one. And he's, you know, he's getting up there now. He's a little north of his mid seventies, and so he uh, he goes, man, I don't want to take these points with me when I go. How about we put in together? And if you want to, you know, take me up to your spot up there, and and uh, you know, that was a no brainer. It took me about a millisecond to agree to that one so we were able to um, come out of the draw with a couple tags and so we're heading up into um, you know the same mountain range that he was videoing um, back there in the mid 80s so a pretty neat storyline there that's pretty cool that is real so so basically with with the stick bows then um, how did you get into actually making them and stuff so, you know, I, like I had alluded to, I hunted for years and years, you know, what, probably a couple decades with my compound and I dabbled in traditional archery. I never entirely left that, but I shot some pigs and, and I, um, I think, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, sheep on, on Santa Cruz Island and some, um, and I shot a buck in South Dakota with my, all of my stick bow, but I was primarily hunting with my compound. And, uh, you know, I, I'd been doing really well, um, with my compound, shot a bunch of different species of animals and, and, uh, a bunch of mule deer that was always, you know, still remained my passion. Um, and then, uh, in 1990, I want to say it was 
2005, I met um, the guy who had founded Stalker Recurves. That's what it was called, you know, at that time. And so we started a relationship then. I did some hunts with him. I um, got a bow from him. And uh, in fast forward to 2007, he had, during that time, he had stopped building bows and taken a job as a construction superintendent. And I think that was in the later in the nineties. And then uh, 2007, he called me up out of the blue said, Hey, I, you know, I need to, um, to clear out this uh, studio. It's was it where his shop was and he needed to clear it out. So his wife could have it for a photography studio. And he offered me, you know, the business and a week's worth of training along with it. And, and, uh, so I was at this stage in my life where I'd been doing construction, you know, high end um, custom woodwork. And I had a cabinet shop and did stairs and floors and handrails. And, but I was doing a lot of work away from home, you know, or five hours from home. And I'd be, I'd spend the whole week down in the Bay area and the North Bay and then come home um, to my wife on the weekends and my kids and all that. And I do that like every other week. And so it really, um, you know, it was taxing on our relationship, taxing on, on uh, my family. And mm-hmm. so I was kind of at this stage in my life where I was ready to, to do something else. And, and uh, so I, fortunately, I just sold a rental property. I had some money. And so uh, Charlie and I worked out a deal and bought uh, Stalker Recurves and then started, you know, building bows and kind of slowly transitioning into that. I um, I worked out some different changes in, in the bow designs and, and so kind of, you know, kept building bows as I was still doing construction. And I think it wasn't in until, I want to say it was 2012 that I quit doing construction entirely. And so, you know, while I was ramping up, I changed the name to Stalker Stick Bows. And while I was ramping up the business and kind of tapering off the construction end of it, um, it took me, you know, whatever that was, five years to, to do that. Um, but at that time, you know, it was extremely nerve wracking. Um, by then, I'd been in construction for 25 years. And, um, you know, to transition out of that, I mean, that's basically a career, you know, really. Um, and then to, to look at shutting that down and, and then venturing out into something else, it was nerve wracking and, and all that, but I had full support for my wife. And so, uh, you know, I'd never look back at once I, I got going, it's, it's been a heck of a ride and it's, you know, the business has really grown. I've got two employees now, two and a half employees, got a, a guy that's interning with me from college right now. So he'll go back to school and in the fall and, but yeah, no, we're doing, we're doing really well. I moved to Colorado about a year and a half ago, you know, to kind of be able to chase, be closer to chasing my mule deer dreams. So it's been all uphill, all, like all, all great. Oh man, I love it. I mean, right outside, you know, I look outside my window, there's a peak that's over 14,000 feet. I've got elk in my backyard, mule deer that walk through the yard occasionally. And it's uh, it's exceptional. Oh man, I got the uh, occasional transient that walks through my yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, more likely to happen for me in Northern California. There's not too many transients up here. It's a little chilly for that. <laughs> yeah. <it is. laughs> yeah. So, uh, so did you have any woodworking skills before you took over this this recurve, uh, the stalker stick pose? Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, you know, really high end uh, woodworking and construction. So I wasn't like a framer or, you know, a carpenter in that respect. I did a lot of radius staircases and inlaid hardwood floors. So I had a really good background, you know, to transition into this. And even before I got into construction, my dad had a wood shop when I was a kid. And, um, so I, you know, I grew up working in there in his wood shop and I've always had a passion um, you know, for woodworking. In fact, it's really only matched by my passion for hunting. So Mm. this was actually, uh, you know, even a better niche fit for me from a woodworking standpoint, instead of doing, you know, kind of a lot of production. And I had up to 13 employees with my construction company. And um, so we did a, you know, really large volume of stuff, but now um, I really get to kind of embrace my my love for woodworking even more. I mean, I'm doing a lot more and varied species of woods that I'm working with. I get to go out and um, you know peruse all these small wood shops and and uh, little you know 
small sawmills that guys have up in the hills and mm -hmm. high grade through their stashes of wood. And I mean, it's right up my alley. I love doing that stuff. It's kind of like an Easter egg hunt. You know, That's you're right. always looking for that one board. <laughs> That's right. Well, how many yeah. bows can you make now? And that you have two employees and yourself. Um, what's your, what's your supply look like? So even with our increased production, we're still pretty low volume. You know, there's, there's guys that certainly boyers that, that churn out a lot more, but my, uh, bow designs are, are fairly complex and the construction process is, um, has got, there's a lot of, of uh, steps involved. And so, you know, even with three of us, I think our biggest month we did uh, just over 30 bows, as I remember. Really? Yeah. That sounds like a lot to me. I mean, I have no idea, but that sounds like a high number to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it's pretty good volume. Um, I brought on uh, my latest full-time employee back in March. So we really haven't been, um, you know, a team for that long. And, and uh, JV, the guy that I re most recently hired, I brought him on as kind of to handle a lot more of the computer stuff. So really, he's been spending the bulk of his time the last few months working on the editing on this DVD, um, this latest DVD project. And so we haven't, you know, had 110% of our focus on bow production. So once we get past this editing and, stuff then we'll our volume will go up our lead times will shrink down and, and uh, we'll get a lot more streamlined still okay well okay. that makes a lot of sense so uh so i have a few things i want you to go over because i'm like i said i'm looking at maybe dabbling into the trad stuff for sure next yep time. um there's a rabbit hole i need to go down real quick yep right to your well it's to your right behind you i see a blue wildebeest uh, uh -huh. did you get that with your bow yeah, so I hunted Africa in 2005 uh, with my compound before you know I started doing the stick bow thing heavy again. So I got I had a heck of an adventure. Um, I went on a 20 day trip to 10 days in South Africa, 10 days in Zimbabwe. Really? And uh, yeah, I, I think I shot 11 animals between the two trips and nine different species. So I had a really you know, incredible experience of so all, you know, kind of plains game, warthogs and impala, the wildebeest, uh, bush buck, blessed buck, mountain reed buck, uh, you know, a zebra, a bunch of animals like that. And it was a really, really fun experience. It's, you know, if anybody has ever has the opportunity to do something like that, I'd highly recommend it. Well, I, I asked this because I, we got back in April and uh, I got myself a, a blue wildebeest. So I was like, man, you know, like it just, when you when you get an experience like that, anytime you have a chance to talk about it or hear somebody else's story, you're like, let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know those those wildebeest, their um, pictures and um, and I, uh, you know, video just doesn't do them justice. How beautiful they are! I couldn't believe. I, I'm so glad. So I got the cape um, flat. You know, you see the rug hanging up on the wall and. I didn't even when I was there really appreciate how beautiful they were. Once it got tanned and brought back and it was cleaned and all that, there's like an iridescent, those stripes are almost like an iridescent color. And as you walk past them, it changes color and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah it's extremely right. beautiful. I had two cameras when I walked up to mine, um, gone with a bow too and everything. And, and one camera did way better of showing the, the, like the iridescence mm -hmm. of the fur and the, as it changes in the light and stuff like that. And the other camera just didn't capture any of it. Yeah. And one, it looks way more bluish gray. And the other one, it's like, it doesn't look like a blue wildebeest. I mean, it just, yeah, it just looks like black, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's, yeah. Someone that actually hasn't seen one in person at the time would never, would never know. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you watch them on video, you know, on national geographic or whatever, it looks like they're just black with gray stripes. Yeah. They are and, so pretty. Yeah, so they cool. are. And they they're are. Fun to hunt. I mean, did you do spot and stock for years? Yeah. So I did, I hunted South Africa, all spot and stock, which was a blast. I mean, that's the kind of the hunting I prefer to do. And then uh, when I hunted Zimbabwe, most of it was, you know, over water or feed, you know, like that. But uh, I did, I shot an Impala spot and stock in Zimbabwe, but really, yeah, everything I shot in, uh, I shot a, in, uh, an Impala spot and stock in South Africa as well. I shot the wildebeest spot and stock, um, a mountain reed buck, a blessed buck, um, a bush buck. Those were all spot and stock. And there may have been some others there in South Africa. I can't recall off the top of my head, but yeah, a bunch of them. 
especially a uh, an Impala. Those things are just twitchy. Oh man, they and are. That's a, that's a quite a a feat just to even get within bow range of one of those things. Yeah, they're they're certainly challenging. And then even getting them in bow range doesn't necessarily and getting a shot off doesn't necessarily equate to a animal in the bag. Man, those things are jumpy. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. So. Well, I just had to go down that rabbit hole, man, because I'm like looking at that thing the whole time. I'm like, I got to hear about that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, I, I shot that one on the first day. I couldn't believe it. Really? Yeah. I got uh, I got super lucky. And it was, oh, uh, man, it was, I got sick twice on that trip. So as soon as I got to South Africa, I got like a, I don't know, it was like a flu or stomach bug or something. And, and I was just like drained. But I'd wake up in the morning and I'd feel okay for a few hours. And I went out and shot that buck. And I think I shot a, a blessed buck maybe on that same morning. And then, you know, by middle of the day, I was just like flat out, wiped out in bed, just, you know, the chills and fever. And then by evening, I'd perk up a little bit, get out to go out to do an evening hunt. And, and then, uh, you know, managed to get it. I, I did pretty well down there, you know, considering. And then I bounced back from that. And, I think it was, I can't remember if it was in the beginning of the trip from South Africa or the beginning of the trip in Zimbabwe, but I got bit by a tick. And by the, by the last day when I was leaving to fly back home, the, the fever and achy joints, you know, set in and I got infected by something from that tick. And so the whole flight home was just like, you know, the chills and shaking and sweating and oh, it was just, it was horrible. That's crazy. You said it because, um, Kim got super sick when she was over there and it lasted about 24 to 36 hours, mm -hmm. uh, throwing up everything. I mean, it, it was yeah. sick. Yeah. It sounds like a similar experience. Yeah. Really weird. It must just be maybe the water or something. I yeah. don't know what it is, but, um, well, for folks that go over there in the future, beware. <laughs> yeah, indeed. No doubt about it. So, um, so run me through, um, well, let's just take this scenario then. I, I have sure. a really good, um, I consider it going to be a really good, I have high expectations of it, mule deer tag for Southwest Oregon or Southeast Oregon this year. And um, I, I've never hunted this unit. I've got a few places to go that I've been given tips from. I'm wanting to stay out of the more timbered area and move more into like the sagebrush with the with the rim rocks and, and, and trees, a little bit of trees, yeah. uh, more mountainy terrain kind of what you're what you're talking about broken to where i can get in range yep. without them seeing me what would be some things that a guy should look for going into a hunt that maybe he's never been wanting to get into the mule deer what are some areas like how how do you find this high alpine spot that's really served you pretty well over the years basically so you know I, interestingly i've never in my life scouted done a scouting trip for mule deer I've because of how far away I've lived. So, you know, it's, I would have to carve off some of my hunting season in order to be able to make the time to be able to go out and scout. So I've always kind of just gone in, um, you know, the day before the season opened. And then if I wasn't getting into deer right out the gate, then it was basically, you know, scouting while hunting essentially. Really? And um, maybe that has contributed to the style that, um, you know, if I, um, once I find an area that I like, I tend to go back there year after year until it stops producing. There are a lot of guys that like to go, you know, look at new country every year. And, and, uh, I certainly love seeing new country, but I also, um, you know, appreciate that the more I know the country, the more likely to be successful I am. Um, so, but initially, like take your scenario right there. Um, what I want to do is, I mean, if, even if I knew like there was um, an area within the unit that I had a tag for that maybe held more deer, but say it was like down in brushier country or, you know, in the timber or something like that, or maybe even in, in uh, a bunch of aspens where the deer like to, to hang out or bed in the aspens, um, I would be more inclined to hunt an area that was more open that had that kind of micro topography that I've alluded to earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and even if it held fewer deer, that's going to give me a greater chance for success than if I'm hunting, you know, country that's thicker, that's harder to, to move through without, you know, making noise. Um, so uh, what I like to do is I like to, um, identify good glassing points 
And especially if I'm able to, you know, say you're hunting on a spine of a main ridge and then there's a lot of finger ridges that drop off of it. If I can put myself on top of that ridge where I can glass as many little basins or both sides of those finger ridges as I can the most efficiently. So, you know, if I'm glassing first light, I'm glassing down into a draw, let's say, or into a basin and it doesn't hold deer. If I can roll off the backside of that ridge and be looking, you know, at another one or just maybe move down the ridge a minimal distance and be glassing into um, new country. So initially I'm trying to cover as much ground as I can just to find deer. Um, and then what I'll do maybe is focus initially my efforts along the top of that ridge. But a lot of times um, deer will end up, you know, further down, lower in elevation off those um, main ridges down on towards the end of those finger ridges. And a lot of times I've seen bucks will end up off the end of those finger ridges where you can't see them from the top of the main ridge. But I'm first, I'm going to take the the easiest opportunities I can first. So I'm going to run that main ridge and I'm going to be glassing down into as many basins as I can and the sides of those finger ridges. Mm -hmm. And then if I'm, you know, typically you're going to find some deer um, using that scenario. And then you may end up, you know, hunting a couple of days, hunting those, those deer. Um, and then if those, you know, eventually you may end up blowing those spots out. And then at that point, then I'm dropping off those main ranges, walking the, the uh, top of those finger ridges, glassing down both sides and then off the end of those fingers where it drops off into the canyons. And I can't tell you how many times I've found deer off the ends of those fingers where it drops off into the canyon. Um, and that is, you know, pretty much hidden from view from running the, the main ridge line back and forth. So let's say that you, you find a good buck mm -hmm. um, right off in the first thing in the morning. He's feeding okay. up to his bedding area. Yep. Uh, you're going to wait for him to bed, or are you going to – what would what would be your play there, depending on the thermals being good and everything? Sure. So typically, you know, at first light, um, your, your thermals are going to be dropping down, and – that deer is going to be, you know, moving, maybe they're not moving far. Sometimes a lot of times they'll, they'll feed, you know, in a small, relatively small area. And then once that sun hits them, they'll, you know, either go and just bed down or they'll line out and they'll, if they have got a spot in mind, they want to go bed at. So I don't like, um, I don't like trying to spot or uh, stalk them when they're still up feeding, especially, you know, like you had alluded to while the thermals, are still a little bit shifty. Um, I'll wait until they go bed. And then uh, particularly if they're on the sunny side of the ridge, you can feel those thermals start to change pretty quick. And I'll kind of use, you know, there's not a hard and fast rule on this one. And it kind of comes down to a little bit of luck and, um, and some, you know, experience having done it a lot of times, but I'll assess where they're bedded at and kind of how shaded it is. And if they're bedded in a spot like they're buried in the shade and that, you know, it might last for three or four or five hours before that sun swings around and shines on them. I'm going to, I'm going to anticipate that they're going to stay there for a while. And then I'm going to go ahead and start my stock earlier rather than later. And, um, but if they're bedded under like a lone tree or a bush or behind a rock or something that I can see that as that sun starts to climb, they're going to get hit there pretty quick then I'm going to just stay tight and then I'm going to let that sun hit them. And then typically they're going to get up and they're going to move to another bedding spot that is, um, you know, got uh, more shade or shade that's going to last longer. And then once they relocate that second time, if I feel like they're in a good, pretty you know good shaded spot, then I'm going to go ahead and start my stock. But I've, I've stocked them, you know, really early right after first light. Uh, when, you know, I've seen them initially go in bed when they've settled into a spot where I feel like, you know, if they move, I'm going to lose sight of them. Um, or if they're just in, it's in a really conducive spot, take, uh, let's see, I've just been working on editing this video. So it was 2016 Nevada and, um, we glassed up me and my two buddies had glassed up, uh, a group of, I think it was four bucks and they were, 
down in this basin directly down below us. And um, there was a fair amount of cover down in the bottom of this basin. Uh, right after first light, they started moving and they were moving away from us further up the canyon and dropping down somewhat in elevation. And where they went and bedded up, it, I mean, it was it was a, a really good opportunity for a stock. But the problem was it was only like 45 minutes after first light and that sun hadn't warmed the hillside up very well, but it was coming up and it was shining on the hillside they were at. And where I was at, way up on the ridge, I was still somewhat in the shaded area and the wind was, I mean, literally blowing from all four points on the compass. But I could see where they were bedded at, that whole hillside was lit up pretty well with the sun. And so I took a gamble because I knew that if they got up and moved their bed, then it was there's a really good chance they were going to move around the corner and I was going to lose sight of them. And with where they're bedded at, it was such a good spot for a stock that I just rolled the dice and decided to drop in after them. And I knew as I went down there that, you know, there was a chance that that wind was going to be blowing down to them. Um, but I also figured that with that sun hitting that hillside, it could be blowing, you know, any different direction where I was at. But with that beginning of that warming, those warming thermals, I was banking on that. The, the uh, thermals were going to start to be blowing up there. And uh, by the time I got down there, I mean, it didn't take me long. That's another thing, too. Um, when you are, you know, at a good distance from them or out of sight, man, I'm going to I'm going to start trucking. And this is where your physical fitness part um, really pays dividends. I want to cover ground as fast as I can to get to the point where I'm going to, you know, pop out and either be within earshot or eyesight of them. Because the, you know, if you're picking your way down through a basin and, and you're moving slow, that only gives them more time to pick up and move while you're, you know, in the middle of your stock. And, and there's a good chance that they're going to move and either be, you know, they might only move a few yards and bed on the wrong side, you know, on the far side of a rock. But at that point, you don't know where they're at. And, uh, and they may well have, you know, picked up and moved completely out of the country. So I want to, you know, I want to keep that deck stacked in my favor. I, um, I picked out good landmarks at this point on the stock. I've got a, a tree that, sh you know, kind of a Y shaped tree that I, a dead one that, um, once I, pop up, you know, within, I'll be within 150 yards of them. I'll be able to use that as an identifier. Um, so I, like I said, I trucked down to the bottom of the basin. It only put, took me maybe 10 minutes to get down there. And then I, I was within about 150 yards. I dropped my, my uh, shoes, put my double pair of socks on. Um, another thing um, with that is I like to get um, long socks that I'm able to pull well up onto my calves over my pant legs. Um, cause no matter what your pant, the fabric on your pants are, it's not going to be as quiet as having socks, um, you know, covering where, you know, the, the lower on your legs, they are loose pants are going to brush together and make a little, I mean, just a, the tiniest little noise mm -hmm. when you're at point blank range on, on, uh, you know, a deer that they're going to pick that up. Um, and so I want to make sure I've got everything as just as dead quiet as I can. So I had, uh, I, you know, put some face camo on. I, I'm a firm believer in that. Maybe not quite as critical if you're shooting a compound and you're, you know, dropping arrows at, you know, 40 plus yards. But when you're trying to get, you know, sub 20 yards or sometimes sub 20 feet, then I want to have every opportunity, um, you know, for a, for a, leg up that I can. So I also wear a shaggy, you know, kind of one of those, uh, it's like a fabric hat, kind of like a ghillie suit hat, if you will. And, um, and then combine that with my face camo. Uh, I mean, ideally that deer is never going to know you're in the neighborhood when you, when you pull up and shoot. But, um, I've had multiple times where, you know, I've had my head sticking up above cover and a deer looks in my direction and I've been able to shoot them. Um, just given that, that few extra seconds. Now, if I was wearing a baseball hat, much sharper outline and didn't have face camo on, I'm going to look like a white out blob with a, you know, real blocky shape to it. And I think that just that few extra seconds that, um, it has afforded me, I've been able to get shots off where I didn't, you know, I don't feel like I would have otherwise, but anyway, back to this situation here. So 
I, um, I take my, my shoes off. I sneak down. The wind is like I had anticipated. It's feeble, but it's coming uphill. And um, I walk over the roll of the hill. I've got a, a couple of big rocks that I'm able to put between me and the bucks. And I get to within about 20 yards. And uh, there's a, a nice um, four by five buck. Uh, if I remember correctly, he had eye guards too, but he was four on one side, five on the other. Mm -hmm. And that was the buck I wanted to shoot. And he was bedded you know, furthest out to the left. So I kept that big rock between me and the deer, snuck up right to the back side of that rock. And then I just kind of poked my head out and he's bedded down, um, you know, broadside to me at roughly 20 yards. And I was able to, to, uh, you know, come back to full draw, lean out from behind the rock and, and, uh, put one right there behind the shoulder. So it all ended up panning out really well. And that's on video and everything. Yeah. Yep. So I had a GoPro going and then uh, Cody and Cody Kellum was and Zach were both up on the ridge above me. You know, one with a, I think one of them had a digiscope going and one of them had a, you know, third DSLR going. Yeah. So yeah, I know it worked out awesome. So how often do you use your hunting partners to guide you into a buck and do you use radios? Cause that's a controversial topic there. Yeah. So um, I have, in the past, um, I think uh, one hunt I used them on on an elk hunt, uh, and I shot a bull kind of with the assistance of a radio. Um, but I, I don't use them on mule deer. Um, you know, I just feel like um, even where they're legal in states where they're legal, yeah. I like the um, the challenge. Maybe the sometimes the frustration to the hand signals, and yeah. you know, you get confused, <laughs> mixed up, and yeah. you know, frustrated, and all that. Uh, you know, sometimes with the hand signals, and the longer you spend hunting with a particular hunting partner, you get those hand signals and the intentions behind them worked out better. But there's always room for misinterpretation, and that happens. You know, it's pretty consistently in my experience. But uh, yeah, I just rely on hand signals. Okay. So, and another question is, I, I've seen the videos where you, where you do the sock thing and then you pull them way up. Um, I had a couple ideas for using like Dr. Scholl's and just shoving those in the bottom of my socks. Uh, uh -huh. I'm worried about getting stuff in my feet and then getting a bunch of crap in my socks. I'm going to have to pick, pick out later. Do you have any of those? Yeah, you pretty much have to figure you're going to have a sacrificial pair of socks or, or maybe even a couple. So what I do is I go to like Walmart and I buy the cheapest, you know, long kind of either tube socks or those heavy duty faux wool socks that I can. And those just stay in a side pocket of my pack where they're accessible quickly in case, you know, I'm say I'm moving from basin to basin and I see something that is a close opportunity, then they're right there. I can reach back, grab them without having to dig into my pack. And, uh, and as far as an insole goes, I think that if you were to use, you know, one of the more rigid insoles that have kind of more of a defined arch, mm -hmm. I think they're going to be too noisy. Oh, really? But if you have, um, you know, one of those Dr. Scholl's, the really thin ones, like old school, yeah. then uh, then those could work. The problem with them, and this is a problem with socks in general, is that if you're side healing with, you know, a double pair of socks on, they're just rolling around your foot. And it's not the greatest footing. And I think with that insole in, like you're alluding to there, I think it would um, maybe compound that more, but I think on flatter ground, uh, it would be a, you know, a good idea and it would help, uh, particularly if you have tender feet like I do, but that's also kind of a, a bonus there with, you know, going with two pairs of socks that you're paying a lot more attention to what you're stepping on and you're going slower as a result of it. And, you know, there are times when you need to go fast and maybe you need to hustle up for a follow-up shot or something. And when you're in your socks, you're definitely hopping and feeling the pain there. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, going in socks, you're picking your footing, which you need to be doing. You're picking your footing carefully, making sure you're, you know, avoiding twigs that, that you're going to snap and what have you. But when you're hunting country with cactus in it, oh yeah, you know, you're, you're definitely going to end up with one in your foot, no matter how careful you are, it seems like. Well, that once that, that point you just made about you forcing you to go slow, what I, what I constantly have to tell myself is is slow down yeah slow down because i'll get into the stock i'll be really good i'll be really diligent about you know i'll, I'll move a twig out of my way if, if it's something if i don't have a spot to step in, i'll literally make a spot to step in just quietly move stuff out of the way and then 
I find myself 10 minutes into the stock. Okay. Now I'm like going twice as fast as I was. And then 20 minutes in the stock. Okay. Now I'm going even faster than that. It's just mm-hmm. like right. moving backwards. I should be going slower the closer I get, but right. right. Um, yeah. It's that, that's a tough one. I mean, I don't know how many times I've blown deer out by, you know, getting over anxious and, and particularly in the beginning of a hunt. I mean, I think that, you know, in society, everything moves at such a fast pace. You know, you're trying to get task A done as quickly as you can so you can move on to task B. Yeah. And then when you get up on the mountain, it's hard to make that mental transition shifting from kind of that production-based pace down to the pace that nature moves at. And uh, I find that, you know, particularly the first hunt of the year and early in that hunt, I'm making mistakes that I wouldn't later in the hunt or later in the year. So I'm noticing a lot of these shots, especially on your videos, that you're shooting them from above, like maybe off of Rimrock. Is that a pretty normal scenario? Yeah, I, I much prefer whenever possible to come down from above. You have a lot of times the curvature of the hill to help hide you. You can stay lower and stay you know, below the vegetation level uh, much easier. And not always, but most of the time, um, you know, deer when they bed they're facing downhill right. uh, a lot of times you know if you have a group of deer a group of bucks then they'll be you know bedded facing in different directions and that can be a uh, you know a hindrance to that might be a stock where hey they're bed in a great position um, but you you wait them out and hope that one of the bucks that's bedded facing you know in the direction that you want to approach gets up and and uh, moves and beds down facing a different direction so there, there can be, you know, those ideal scenarios where you have a deer that is, you know, in a perfect spot otherwise, but facing the wrong direction and it makes it a no go. So most of your deer that you shot then have been bedded once they get to their feeding area or watering area to where they bed. And how often are you ambushing these things or, or knowing where you think they're going to go? Are you, are you cutting them off like you would an elk? Um... I'm trying to think. I don't know. I, I can't think of. And there may be a case where that I've done that, but I can't think of one that comes to, to mind um, really? You know where I've gotten ahead of them when they're moving. Um, I, I know I can think of a black tail that I shot on the Trinity Alps that, you know, was coming up out of his bedding area, working his way up towards the top of the ridge and, I mean, it wasn't long bef- between the time that I spotted him and the time that I shot him, but I kind of had gotten in the direction. So he moved, you know, closer to me when I shot, but that's about as close. I've never had really an elaborate, oh, I think he's going to go through this escape chute. So I run up ahead of him and, and get ahead of him. Yeah, usually it's it's almost all, you know, sneak up on him when they're bedded and, and uh, they're stationary. I just think, you know, particularly with the stick bow, that um, you need so much more control over the situation. And so waiting for them to bed really um, is your best bet on trying to make it happen. Because if you, um, if they're up feeding, they could, you know, and you go, okay, man, they're in a perfect spot right now. And then I can get to this spot easily and I'll be easily, you know, I'll be well within my effective shooting range. Well, that takes you even five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever, to get to that spot very likely they're going to have moved off enough distance that when you pop up, then they're going to be outside of your effective range. That makes a lot of sense. And I've, you know, I've been guilty of trying to catch or, or, or keep up with a meal there. And even, even a feeding meal there can be hard to keep up with the train <clears throat> being the way it is and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. When you, when you shoot a compound, you know, that's maybe less, of an issue, particularly if your effective range, you know, is out there 60 yards or, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. But man, when you're, when you, you know, when things get shaky past 20, then, uh, you know, it really, um, you need, you need to have them stationary. That's what, at least my philosophy anyway. That's a good point. Cause you're like, you're, like you're saying, you're, you're stacking the deck in your favor <clears throat> and putting mm-hmm. all the odds. Cause really when you go out there, it's like everything's in really the deer's favor until you can get those scenarios to work yep. and tip those things in your favor. So that, that to me is a really good tip right there. I mean, and so here's another scenario I want to run by you. So you talk about having this little micro, uh, what do you call them? Micro topography. Micro topographies. So that could be, um, could that be just a little bit of broadleaf 
in an area or is that just like a, um, a patch of aspens? Um, I, it can really be anything from, from bushes, trees, more what I rely on though is actually broken kind of more broken country okay. where, um, you know, you'll have little dips and swales or rock outcroppings, things like that, that are going to, you know, put the deer on one side of, um, of a, a an obstruction and then give you an approach route from from behind or above that you're able to then you know use that for concealment to sneak in where you're not exposing yourself mm -hmm. um, you know and a lot of times when you are sitting up on that glassing point um, that kind of topography really becomes two-dimensional and so when you're looking at it from way above it looks like it's flat and there's no possibility for approach and it does take some experience and some really close scrutinizing oftentimes to identify that. Um, I mean, I don't know how many times I've, I've seen, you know, I've spotted a buck and go, oh, man, it's a beautiful deer. But there's no way to get on that buck. And then I'll look, I'll start really scrutinizing the country around him and then backing up even further and looking at, you know, a possible an approach and then go, wait a second here, if I came in from this angle here, um, yeah, I might be exposed for, you know, the first bit of the stock, um, and I'm gonna have to move slowly there. But then when I get to this point here, you know, that, uh, that rock or that, what looks like a, um, a little minor bump in topography between that location and the deer is going to obstruct his view. And then I can just I can really cook across the bottom of that basin or down the side of that ridge and he's not going to be in sight. And I don't know how many times, you know, I have looked at scenarios and, uh, and figured there's no way and then ended up going up and shooting, shooting that deer after I identified some minor, you know, variations in topography that allowed me a closer approach. How often would you not make a stock on a buck based on what you've seen and, and wait for maybe him to make his move or the next day um <clears throat> so i'm editing uh some footage from 2015 in nevada where i sat on a buck for nine and a half hours waiting for him to get up out of his bed and move to a spot that i could stalk him and, the, and he got up a few times and would re-bed and at one point i shouldered my pack and mm. and i uh, was ready to start my stock and then all of a sudden he got up again and then moved to another spot that wasn't conducive for a stock so i mean he might only need to move a few yards to make it a difference between a go and a no-go and in this case um i sat on this deer all day long and then you know finally as that evening um started to uh you know the sun started to drop behind the ridge and the shadow started growing and then the thermal started switching and started getting a little more shifty. I had to back out and he was still bedded and I didn't have an opportunity for a shot. So I backed out and, um, and then came back in there the next morning, hoping, you know, that I was going to be able to find him again. And fortunately found him. And then I was able to sneak down, you know, later that morning and shot him in his bed. So, you know, patience, and being able to identify when there's an opportunity for a good high percentage stock and when there isn't. I like to look at stock scenarios as either high percentage or low percentage. Okay. And I'm only going to play with a low percentage opportunity when, um, when one of two things happens. Either I'm in an area where there's a lot of deer, mm -hmm. and so I know that if I blow this opportunity, then I've got, you know, I could pop into the next base and I'll, I'll have something else to play with or it's coming down to the end of my hunt and I uh, and you know if I don't make something happen if I don't just try to increase my percentage by taking multiple stocks then I uh, then I'm going to let that animal go either sit and watch him and hope that he gets up and moves into a position that's more conducive for a stock or, you know, wait until the next day and, and then see if, you know, something else will materialize out of it. But it's not often that I'll, I'll, uh, you know, sit on a deer all day and then come back and try to hunt them. I'm usually, you know, if, if it looks like this is a no go, then I'll, I'll try to, you know, go into another base and find another opportunity that, um, you know, but if I've been in an area, say for a week and I've riled everything up and I've blown stocks left and right and, and, uh, <clears throat> 
I'm down to, you know, where, okay, I got a buck bedded, then I may be more inclined to sit on him and, and wait till he moves. So let's talk about what time of the year you're hunting these things. Cause I like early season before they strip their velvet, they're usually out in the units and with your mule deer, you know, you have way more open areas and stuff. So if you had to choose a week or what week do you usually like to hunt these bigger bucks? Yeah. So I like to hunt the opening week. Um, once they shed their velvet, they're typically, you know, they might only move a few hundred yards, but, but, you know, they're going from above Alpine and dropping down into the trees. Typically they spend less time in the open. They're usually then bedding in brush or in the timber and my chances of, uh, of filling a tag have just just dropped, you know, really, really low. Really? The only time that I'll hunt hard horned bucks, it typically is like if I'm hunting South Dakota or, you know, uh, say Nebraska, where you're hunting more of grasslands, more the badlands, open country like that, where, um, you know, you're hunting some coolies, some tighter country, but, you know, they're bedding and, and maybe a little bit more cover, but it's still, you know, that country's so open that, you know, maybe they're heading into a little patch of junipers or, or bedding in a tight, tucked up in the little coolie or something. And then, um, you still have that kind of more open, um, open type of terrain to, to be able to approach them. But if, if it's Colorado or Nevada and they've shed their velvet, you know, I'm, I'm usually home working, building bows. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the same thing with blacktail here. I, I, I love early season blacktail. I'm like the, the odd sheep here where I'm from. Everybody waits till uh, late season to go. Cause it's yeah. bigger bucks, you know, but my argument is, well, there's those bucks don't just magically show up, you know, and, and, and if some of them do in November, I mean, but, they're still there if you can glass the units. They're in the middle of the units. They're out till 10, 10 30 in the morning feeding. Mm -hmm. yep. they're, they're dumb, haven't been pressured. Why would you not go after some of these 120, 130 inch, you know, black tail just because it's hot outside? I mean, that's because most of the guys are chasing elk. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you there. And, and I, I had to wait um, last year because we were going over Eastern Oregon for, for an elk tag. And so, I had this buck that I'd been um, seeing bear hunting throughout the year. And I'm like, you know, I'll just go up there and just see if he's there. I'd seen him like three or four times and in the same spot. And uh, when you know it, he was there. And so, I mean, I filled my, I filled my blacktail tag on a nice, nice buck last year opening day. And I'd never shot a velvet buck before. And literally mm -hmm. I mean, everything that I had envisioned and, and hoped for, I mean, last year it came together on opening day before we went elk hunting. So I just, the more, since that the experience, I've been all about early season, kind of like what you're saying, opening, opening yeah. weekend or opening week. Well, blacktails, yeah, blacktails are even worse than mule deer. You know, when they, I, I cut my teeth hunting blacktails living in Northwestern California. And I think I've, um, I think I've shot 15 Pope and Young class uh, blacktails. And, um, I want to say of those, only a couple of them were hard horned, really? um, you know, where I got, where I went out and hunted them on the, like that last week, a rifle or with my bow, but went out, you know, there during rifle season and, uh, and shot them. Then when they started to act a little bit more ruddy and, you know, maybe they were coming out in the open a little bit more, but man, blacktails, when they strip their velvet, yeah, they're ghosts, you know, you might as well just, uh, uh, be hunting phantoms at that point. I spent a lot of time up in the wilderness areas in Northwestern California, the Marble Mountains, the Trinity Alps, some time in the Yola Bolis and hunted them in there. And I, I do the same thing. I'd focus on that first week of archery season when most of the time it's interesting, you know, California, um, uh, it's got seasons that open in July, second weekend in July, they're on the coast and um, you know, they'll be shedding their velvet, by maybe say the second week of archery season uh, down, you know, say in the San Rosa central part of the state down just north of San Francisco. And then you might only move uh, 150 miles up the state and they're, um, they're shedding their velvet, uh, you know, two or three weeks later than that. It's not taking much difference from a ge geographical standpoint um, distance wise for that, that process to be happening so much later. And then you move inland a little bit more and they're stripping their velvet even later, you know, towards that first part of September. 
And so, you know, you can get in, um, fortunately the way the, the seasons are staggered there in California, you can usually get that first week of archery season and they're still in velvet. And that's, I always focus my efforts, you know, that first week when they're in velvet and I'm trying to hunt them in as open country as I can. And, uh, blacktails, um, you know, my hat's off to anybody who is shooting a mature blacktail during, um, you know, on public lands. Those are some tough, tough animals to, to shoot. They are very wary. Um, the country that they inhabit is not as conducive to spot and stalk typically as mule deer country is. It usually has more brush in it, even when they're, you know, still in velvet. Most of those time, most of the time, those blacktails will be heading for some thicker cover. Um, not maybe as thick as when it uh, when they shed their velvet and become hard horned, but they're usually bedding in country that it, if you can get on them, it's you're you're going to be doing the thread the needle shot with mm -hmm. the bow to try to get you know one into their bedding area. That makes a lot of sense, and and yeah, I mean blacktails. I mean, I grew up just like you hunting blacktails more. The the mule deer thing is it's a special thing because you have to actually draw a tag to go do that. Uh, uh -huh. a rifle over here anyways so i've only got a couple mule deer and that's why i'm really wanting to get after it with my bow and get it you know i'd love to shoot that one behind you that four point up there on the wall i mean that's to me that's that's a definitely i'd take that buck every year <laughs> yeah that was my first one that's the really? one i shot in oregon that was my first buck and actually talk about a squeaker it made pope and young by one inch <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> yeah so I saw it, shot him in my socks, shot him with a compound. I was still shooting instinctive with the compound back yeah. then. So it was a pretty primitive setup. I mean, I probably have a recurve that shoots faster than that compound <laughs> did back in, you know, in the day back then. But yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, it's been extremely uh, an enjoyable experience, you know, all through. I still cherish all those memories of when I was hunting with the compound equally to, you know, when I was shooting this, what, now that I'm shooting the stick bow. Um, though, you know, it's hard to beat that feeling of, of satisfaction when, um, you know, so much more relies on, on what you have, you know, going on between your ears with a, uh, with a recurve that it does with a compound, just having that fixed, um, sight, you know, sight pin there, yeah. you can mentally make more mistakes and still have, you know, a successful shot than if, uh, if you're not, you know, dialed 110%. Um, when you're trying to instinctively place an arrow, it uh, <laughs> a lot of things can go wrong. I've blown some really close shots with my recurve. So I want to go over that because I, I I have no idea um, really when it comes to to traditional what it what the best route to go is. I I've done a little bit. I, I, I can't see it over there. Actually, maybe you can. There's a family heirloom recurve I just got a couple weeks ago, and I'm all right using that or or I don't know. I mean. I have no idea. So, but what I have learned is that the re recurve guys know how to build an arrow probably more better than, than the uh, compound guys to get the max efficiency and max, max everything out of their arrow compared to a compound guy. And so I've been using a lot of the traditional mindsets lately, giving my own uh, arrow setups a little bit more weight up front and, and cut on contact and stuff like that. So I'd be really interested in hearing your take on, on what arrow setups you know what what's a what what can the arrow do at certain ranges um what what are your limits and stuff like that sure so let me get i give a little bit of a background maybe just so that people you know can will know kind of the where i'm coming from with my perspective at this point because okay. i've gone through the whole gamut i mean i started out obviously thinking i could draw any string with my compound and have different draw weights so i was <laughs> i was as green as it came right right um and back then we didn't have the internet you know to learn from and there weren't um in the community that i lived in there was nobody literally nobody who bow hunted and so um i kind of went to the school of hard knocks from a learning perspective. And um, I, you know, I started ordering my own equipment while I was in high school, building my own arrows, fletching my own arrows. Um, you know, when I, when I got my first overdraw, I just chopped off my existing arrows, you know, chopped four inches off of them and uh, mounted broadheads on a shorter arrow and, and couldn't figure out why my, you know, my broadheads weren't flying with my field points and didn't understand, you know, arrow spine to the degree that I do now. Um, 
I went through the whole speed craze, you know, the try to shoot the, the fastest bow you could. I shot expandables. I shot fixed blades. I shot with, uh, you know, guessing the yardage when, then when, uh, the ranging range finders came out pre laser range finder with the, the two, you know, fuzzy images. And then you turn the dial until the two images became one. And then that was your range finder. I mean, I, um, you know, I've got a, a lot of years of doing this. And uh, when I transitioned from shooting a compound to shooting a stick bow, I was still in that speed craze shooting a 400 grain arrow and um, consequently, you know, didn't have the, the greatest uh, setup when I, uh, when I was shooting my stick bow. I was shooting, a, I don't know, it might have been a 400 grain, 450 grain arrow. I think I had 150 grain um, uh, really large diameter broadhead. I, I don't remember the make off the top of my head, but it was a, a cut on contact broadhead. I was smart enough to, to do that. Um, but I was successful with that setup. Um, you know, I, I killed a, a mule deer on my first hunt uh, with that setup and, and got great penetration, but I think it was more luck than it was um, because I, um, I had a great setup. I mean, I hit, a, um, I hit an elk uh, I, on that same hunt. I, uh, I took a shot at a, um, a spike bull. Um, my arrow got deflected off a twig between me and the elk, and I hit it in a rib. And, uh, and literally the rib, because that arrow was coming in at an angle, you know, not knock behind broadhead, um, I lost a ton of energy. And with a light arrow, um, that, that uh, arrow just hit, the, hit that rib, the broadhead hit the rib, um, and then, you know, essentially bounced off of it. It didn't get any penetration. And uh, had I been shooting um, a setup where, um, you know, maybe even, I would hesitate to say the same setup because that was really light. I should have been shooting a heavier arrow. Now my setup is I'm shooting a 565 grain arrow. Um, and almost all of that weight is, uh, is forward of center. So I'm shooting a 27% FOC setup. So I've got a 250 grain, uh, broadhead. Uh, my inserts are, um, I want to say that they're, Oh, somewhere north of 50 grains. Um, I don't remember the exact weight, but I'm shooting that Valkyrie setup. So it's a, a long broadhead. It's that three to one ratio where the length of the broadhead is three times the width. So you're getting a long you know, broadhead that's going to take minimal amount of energy to push through that hide and into the vitals. And I think um, like if you take that example of, of that bull, okay, um, when that arrow, if I'd have been shooting a higher FOC setup, um, when that branch kicked that, that arrow there, um, and that, that arrow hit that bull because of the setup I had, that, that weight was much more evenly distributed over the length of the shaft. So, um, when you have all of that weight, but directly behind the broadhead, it's going to essentially, you know, be like a hammer pounding a nail. You've got that weight driving, that broadhead into the animal, but as soon as that that back end of that arrow is slightly off from being directly behind the broadhead, then all of a sudden you have weight that's actually pushing sideways instead of pushing directly behind the broadhead. Now, conversely, if you were to take all that weight and put it at the head of the arrow, and you were to take that same situation where you have that arrow coming in not perfectly aligned you know, that knock not perfectly aligned to the broadhead, all of a sudden all your weight or the bulk of it is in the front end of that arrow, much more of that energy is going to be transferred into penetration and, uh, and less of it lost in sideways action of that, um, you know, that shaft coming in at a slight angle mm -hmm. to the, the path of the broadhead. So, you know, maybe I would have, maybe I would have blown through that rib. Maybe I wouldn't have. But, you know, when you're playing a game of percentages, that's kind of what, you know, bow hunting is. And the, the more percentages you stack in your favor, whether it be from a stock, whether it be from your equipment setup, your shot, or what have you, then the greater your chances of success are going to be when you, um, you know, when you pull it all together there. So, 
um, I, I can't even remember exactly what direction your your question was there, but I hope that I, I yeah. came close to answering. So when you're when you're shooting that kind of FOC, that tells me that you're using a pretty light GPI arrow. Mm -hmm. uh, what arrow? What arrow are, are you using? So I'm shooting the gold tip Pierce. Okay, it's kind of a micro diameter shaft there. Yeah. So I, I have a hard time getting higher FOCs with the with the Eastons I use. Um, yep. I mean that's the only thing I would really like is to come out. And they have lighter arrows, I, I understand, but like a, a micro diameter, like mm -hmm. like a version of, of gold tips platinum pierce kind of thing. Right, right. Um, that way I could get up to about 20%. Because I, I eventually do want to get to 20%, but I'd be like 600 and something grains to do that. Yeah, you know, once you get up that high, then you lose your trajectory, you know, which to a degree is not a big deal because most of the time guys are shooting with a range finder. But in that instance where you have, you know, a split second, you don't have the time to use your range finder and your, your range estimation comes into play, then that all of a sudden becomes a much greater issue. I mean, to a degree, it's an issue of shooting the stick, though. Obviously, the flatter t the trajectory you have, then, um, you know, the, the less critical, um, you know, the range misidentification um, is going to be. But... You know, with a stick bow, we're playing with lower energy, you know, bows. And so it's important that you have, you know, more important than having a, a super flat trajectory. If you're walking that line where you are shooting a, you know, a setup that, um, I mean, I'm shooting, the, the, the setup I'm shooting this year, I'm shooting 52 pounds. I have a, about a 27 and a quarter inch draw length. So I don't have a super long power stroke. Mm -hmm. I'm shooting a 565 grain arrow. So I'm shooting, you know, approximately 11 grains per pound, um, which is a heavy setup. I mean, I, I kind of tell guys that are shooting a stick bow, try to be at least nine grains per pound. If you can be 10, that's better. 11 is getting onto the heavier side. So I don't have a great, you know, a great flat trajectory, but I want to, I'm willing to sacrifice some trajectory for better penetration. Um, I, I try to get sub 20 yards when I can. I have shot mule deer as far as 40 with my stick bow. Hmm. Um, but those were on days when I, I stump shoot constantly when I'm out there hunting. So, you know, on one, on one day I might, um, yeah, you know, I might just be dialed and just be hammer and stuff. And so, you know, I'll, maybe my effective range on that day will be 40 yards. And the next day, you know, I might not be able to shoot my way out of a wet paper bag. And so by stump shooting, I'll have established kind of how I'm shooting at that time. And then I'll limit my range, um, you know, of my effective range based on how I feel that day. Really? Uh, a great example. Yeah, I, I shot a buck. Um, in 2015 on that Nevada hunt I was telling you about earlier the day before I shot that buck man I was walking around I was just nailing everything I was shooting at and then that morning um, that I shot that buck I my left right was great but my elevation I would shoot high on one shot low on the next shot and I was man I mean it was not good for my head um, but it was important that I knew where I was at so I knew that day I was like man I need to get close Today, I need to get close. And if I can get a shot at an animal where I'm shooting, you know, um, at, say, the top of its back bedded and I have more length, you know, more essentially more distance um, that I'm, you know, if I shoot low, great. If I can shoot, shoot a little high, it's not going to be as critical. Uh, I knew I, I needed a shot that day where I wasn't threading the needle. And Fortunately, the way the scenario worked out, I, I found that buck, he was bedded, and I was able to approach him, come in from behind him. So I was, just, I was shooting down from above, so I had a long shot at, into the top of his back, and I had, a, you know, uh, 16 inches, we'll say, of, of distance where if I shot anywhere along in that line, I was going to hit him in the vitals, and, and uh, I smoked him. You know, I, I made a, a good shot and I shot at a distance I was comfortable. I sh it was about a 15, actually it was less than a 15 yard shot. Um, but I knew at that distance, even if I was shooting, you know, as bad as I, if I shot my worst shot that I had shot earlier that morning, I was still, I was well within the 10 ring range of where I needed to be. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important to say from an ethical standpoint that, um, you know, that whether you're shooting a compound, you know, a long range rifle or whatever it is, 
you know, you don't want to be out there poking holes in animals on a, on a wish, you know, on a whim, a hope or a prayer. You want to make sure that, you know, you're within your effective range and it's not a, geez, I hope when I shoot this that, uh, you know, I let this thing go that it's, uh, that I hit it. You want to be, you know, the highest percentage that you can to, uh, you know, to success there. Right. And th that's really well put. The way that I've always asked, you know, people like, how far do you shoot? And I'm like, it's so scenario dependent in, in mm -hmm. animal, but I'll tell you when I don't shoot. And that's easier to say. And it's basically piggybacking off of what you say. But my, my motto is if I'm hoping to hit the animal, I'm not going to take the shot. If I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the animal is going to die, if it stands there for my arrow to get there and the scenario's right, it's going, it's going to get hit right where I want. And, and if you're taking shots like that, and, and um, a lot of this is for long range stuff, because I've gotten into long range stuff too a little bit, but, and I was learning long range and I'm trying to learn, you know, that stuff too. And, and the guy, you know, same philosophy. If you're hoping, if you're taking shots, hoping to hit it, don't take a shot. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I had a scenario that comes to mind, you know, just like what we're talking about. And it was, it was winding down at the end of a hunt and, um, you know, I may have been the last day or second to the last day. And, and, uh, I knew my opportunities were getting slim and I still had a valid deer tag in my pocket and I had dropped a ton of elevation to get down in this basin on the stock and, and I circled around, made a great stock on these deer while I was moving on them. They all got up and had, uh, started feeding and dropped down a little lower in elevation and I came up over the top of this little rise and I had this buck about 40 yards mm -hmm. and at that time I was shooting really well it was, a, it was a relatively steep downhill shot the buck was quartering away I had a shot right in the top of his back um, and I drew back and it just didn't feel 100% and I let down and I uh, and ended up eating my tag that year uh, but I felt better about doing that than I did about, you know, putting an arrow or sending an arrow and, and hoping that it was going to end, you know, it was going to end well, you know, it just, you know, when you, there's times when you draw back and you let loose and you're a hundred percent confident and, you know, it, it may work out and it might not work out. It's, you know, that, that deer could jump the string on you or any number of things could happen. And you, you might place it exactly where you wanted and, and it worked out just as you had envisioned, but it's those scenarios when you cut the shot and, and uh, you're not totally confident that those are the, the ones where, man, you're skating on thin ice. Yeah. And, and hearing your story about that, um, there's a black tail quite a few years ago. I killed, I drew on them. I think it was 71 <clears throat> yards and mm -hmm. I, a ringer. I mean, I would, I'd been shooting my bow so much that year. I was like, okay, I, you know, I'm hitting playing cards four out of five times. And my fifth arrow is the flexings are touching the, you know, the card kind of thing. And, uh, I just drew back and I just wasn't steady. Wasn't steady. Wasn't steady. Drew down, you know, let, let down, took a big deep breath, drew back again. And then that pen, that pen just <laughs> right there. And then I ended up killing them. I mean, just having that, that, self-awareness that you're not at your you're not at your peak you're not at your best on this on this draw or on this deer or on that scenario you should really it takes a lot of self-control you know and yeah. and um you know it's just to the point of how bad do you either want that deer are you making that shot just because you want to say you made that shot are you you know so that's the stuff that i've i've um that i've struggled with you know starting off as, as a as a young you know, not having really any mentorship with the bow hunting and stuff, but kind of sounds like you've, you've, you're, you know, you're down that road. You've, I've never heard anybody talked about having a fluid effective range and it just totally makes sense to me. I mean, being able to, <laughs> yeah. to have that en enough self-control to where you can say, I'm just not there today, guys. You know, like every time I hit the woods, you know, with, with one of my hunting partners, it's like, yeah, you know, just get me within 70 or kind of thing or and mm -hmm. it's just like well you know today maybe my shoulder's not feeling good or maybe maybe something's not something's not right or or i worked out the night before you know and whatever it may be it's just um just hearing you talk about that really really sets it home for me that that there are guys that i, I had no idea that guys did that i mean that's that's good to see so. Yeah, I remember, you know, back in the day when I was shooting a compound, I was watching the same archery shop that I had 
referenced earlier, I was watching a video and it was an elk hunting video and there's some trad guys in there and, uh, and a bull comes walking out broadside to the guy and it was, you know, just the dream scenario. Bull steps his leg forward, guy's right there, he draws his bow back, you're just dying of anticipation to watch that arrow arc in there and he lets down, that bull walks off and I don't remember the 20 or 25 yard shot and the guy you know, after the bull leaves, guy turns to the camera and said, man, I just did not feel, it didn't feel right. And I didn't understand that at that time. And I was just like, I'm yelling at the TV, shoot, you idiot, shoot, you know, like this. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm just like, man, what a moron and all this. And, and uh, after the guy lets this bull walk and I just could not comprehend it, but I didn't have the experience at that time in my life, you know, and, and uh, now I do, you know, and, and, there's once you loose that arrow, man, you can't get that thing back. And if you've done that, where you've taken a shot when you shouldn't have, and you've come away with that experience, then it is easier to let an animal walk when you know you, you, that's like, oh, I, I remember that familiar feeling. And this feels a lot like that. And yeah. I would rather let an animal walk than, than uh, you know, cut a shot where I didn't feel solid about it and then end up you know, wounding in the, and losing an animal. Exactly. And, and it cannot even be the shooter. It could be wind. I mean, it could yep. be, mm -hmm. could be anything. Your arm yeah. is a pretty good sale, you know? Yeah. I mean, yep. so, uh, for, for a guy like me, that's thinking about getting in it. Um, I, I'm leaning towards going with a, with a 40 to 45 pound bow just to learn on. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe bumping up to a 50 pound. I have a 50 pound, I have two 50 pound recurves. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I almost feel rushed to get them off because I get it back and it's like, and then I pluck the string and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. I feel like if I had a 45 pound, I could come right back and, and or I, I do the three below. Uh, yep, three under. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like I could just really focus and then and then actually get that not plucking thing. Because when I started right. shooting, um, I was using like um, uh, compound kind of thing. Like you want your arm to, or you want everything to come back and everything. And, and uh, my buddies were making fun of me because my hand would always go like over to the side like this, uh -huh. <laughs> and like I was just plucking the crap out of it. And, yeah. Uh, and I just I think that was one me being an idiot. I didn't know what I was doing. And then two, it was really heavy for me. Fifty pounds is, for a compound guy that doesn't sound like a lot, but for no, it a traditional recurve guy that you know I, I was struggling with it. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you do there? So for reference there when i transitioned from shooting a compound into doing this full time with my stick i was shooting about 75 with my compound okay and i think when i shot that mule deer that first year i think my bow was about 48 really um yeah so you don't need um, a lot of draw weight there's a, a kind of a real misconception there and, and i kind of fell into that too you know i felt like man i'm just this is inadequate you know i need to be shooting more weight but really that's what I was comfortable from an accuracy standpoint is what I shot the best. And I was had enough experience and was smart enough to know that, you know, it's a lot more important to shoot an arrow where you need it to go than it is to shoot it a little bit faster and hit, you know, inches off where you wanted the arrow to go or want the arrow to go. So, um, you know, I think that, that you're on the right track there. And I think, you know, dropping down to the low forties to work on your form, build those muscles up, kind of get accustomed to, to because there's a huge difference between shooting a, a holding a recurve at full draw and holding a compound at full draw. I mean, I can't uh, stress that one enough there. Um, so uh, um, yeah, you know, going, starting out there and you're in the low forties, you know, and then, I mean, there, if you, you can get on, um, on uh, eBay or even buy a new one. The Sage Samic is a uh, you know Chinese made bow. They're inexpensive. You can get one for well under two hundred bucks, and uh, you know pick one of those up. Uh, low draw weight, and and then uh, you know work on your shooting form, work on um, you know conditioning your muscles, kind of getting used to it. I think a great idea too is to shoot a clicker, um, so that you know there's a couple schools of thought that there's a lot of information out there right now um, on shooting clickers and, and using them for both a draw check mm -hmm. and then also for a psycho trigger, which is 
you know, you're drawing back the bow, you're using your back tension to pull through. And once that clicker pops, that's your signal to, to release the string. Um, personally, I use it more as a draw check than as a psycho trigger. Although I, I do use, um, I, I do use it also when that thing pops to, to, uh, for a signal for me to, to cut the shot. Um, but a lot of times I'll draw my clicker will pop and, and I'm not settled in yet. Mm. And, uh, and so I'll hold it through the clicker for, you know, a second or so longer. Um, but using that clicker to establish a consistent draw length, because I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, if you're drawn with a compound, it's, it's a no brainer. You have that Valley, your, your, uh, cam rolls over, drops into that Valley and you're shooting from the same spot every time. Um, when you're shooting a recurve, it's like having an old school compound with a one inch, you know, deep, wide valley where you, know, you could be shooting at the front or the back. And it's a huge difference between the two. Um, and particularly when you get into a weird shot angle, maybe you're shooting downhill, you're going to have a tendency to short draw your bow. And so obviously, you know, if you're shooting an inch shorter in draw length, that's a significant amount of power stroke and weight difference. Because when you're shooting a recurve, if, if uh, you know, you're shooting a recurve that's rated 50 pounds at 28 inches and you're only drawing 27, you're going to be pulling you know, roughly 47 pounds. Um, and so if you short draw it an inch, you're just drop your draw weight by three pounds and shorten your power stroke. So it's a lot less energy putting into the, um, into the arrow there. So then, you know, there goes a low miss and, uh, so, you know, yeah, definitely. I agree with you start shooting, you know, work on your shooting form with a lower draw weight bow, uh, put a clicker on there. It's a great idea. You don't necessarily have to hunt with one. Um, if you Google, if you decide to hunt with one, which I, I mean, I'm going to leave mine on through the hunting season myself. And, uh, when you get them out of the box or out of the, the little bag there and stick them on your bow, they're pretty noisy. Um, but there's YouTube videos on quieting them by just putting some Velcro, some adhesive Velcro on both sides of the little metal tab. Um, and you can make it almost inaud inaudible, but you'll feel the little pop, you know, when you're, um, when you're drawing through the clicker, pulling through the clicker. So, you know, even if you can't hear it, then you can feel it. And uh, so, yeah, for sure. Now you're, you're heading down the right path there. And like you said, you alluded that you're shooting three fingers under, which if you're new, um, I like that myself. I started out shooting split, split finger one above and two below the arrow. And uh, when you're shooting three under, you're putting that arrow closer under your eye. So it's more like shooting over, you know, shooting over the top of a shotgun barrel. You're pointing a lot more. And, and guys will, a lot of guys will gap shoot that way versus shooting instinctive. So they'll use the point of their arrow in reference to where they want to aim. And and there's, you know, there are a lot of, of uh, traditional purists that, you know, kind of really poo-poo that technique because they feel like, you know, shooting instinctive is, is uh, um, more pure. But, you know, I say whatever it takes to get the arrow where it needs to go. If you can shoot more accurately, shooting three under and gap shooting, man, by all means, do that. Because um, if you can shoot a, you know, a pop can size target at 20 yards shooting, uh, you know, gap shooting versus a, a paper plate at 20 yards shooting instinctive, man, I'm going to take that gap shooting every day. Right. That makes a lot of sense to me too. And I was, so I was watching this uh, guy, Iron Mind, uh, uh, the Joel Turner guy, mm -hmm. he shoots some, some with a glove and he like holds it <clears throat> or something. And and Joel's an anomaly. <laughs> that guy's an amazing shot. And uh, he's got some great philosophies in his mental side of shooting. But if you're looking at from a bow setup, mm -hmm. I feel like you couldn't go any worse than to follow the same path that he's at. And I'm sure he would say the same thing too. Um, but he's just next level on his skills. Yeah. Yeah. He was saying, he's like, you know, a lot of guys have, you know, problems doing it the way that I do. He's like, but it works for me. And and there's got to be that point where you got to do what works for you. You know, like if, if for a lot of guys, you know, I see a lot of guys cause around here at Cameron Haynes, they're shooting with their thumb behind their head. I'm like, or behind their yep. head. I'm like, you know, that's not proper, but who gives a crap if you're shooting good groups at whatever range you shoot, I don't care. You know, yeah, I'm not a bow Nazi, but um, there are, there are things that, that do make sense for consistency that, you know, I don't know. You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, I'm, I'm in that of that vintage that Cam was as well. And when I shot a compound, I did the same thing. I mean, I never heard of back tension. 
And, uh, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm shooting, I'm not a big guy. I'm five, seven. And with the compound, I've got about 27 and a half inch draw. And, but I, you know, in that speed craze, at one point I shot a 30 inch draw and I was anchoring, I was stretched out. I was, you know, I was shooting, uh, I can't even remember what kind of release it was, but it had a very short neck on it. So I could increase my draw length as much as possible. I was leaning back into my shot. I mean, I was doing everything wrong but I could replicate it and I was shooting really well. Um, but that's not at all the right form. I mean, if you look at pictures of me back in the day, you'd just, you know, be in stitches laughing. Um, but it worked for me and, and I made it work. And that was part of the evolution of, uh, of my growth in, you know, in shooting a bow. Uh, but there's a, a ton of information out there now. Um, the push podcast is a fantastic resource for guys that are wanting to, to try out traditional archery. You can get started, you know, on the right foot, listening to that podcast and absorbing a lot of their information. So that's a great resource there. Good. Good. So, well, I think we covered quite a bit. I got the mule deer from you and I got some of the, the beginner stuff from, from the trad things. Is there anything that you wanted to, to mention or, or, or give a shout out to before we got off here? So, um, I think I, I know I talked about this DVD I'm working on. It's uh, July 4th today. I'm hoping that, you know, by the middle of the month, towards the end of the month here, that we're going to have this uh, to the replicators getting produced into DVDs. Mm -hmm. um, so watch uh, my social media feed on Instagram or Facebook, Stalker Stick Bows. Okay. And we'll certainly be announcing the release of it. I'll send you a copy so that you're able to, to check it out and you can talk to the listeners about it. And then, uh, um, so, you know, guys, keep an eye out for that. Um, I also, as you had said, I do a podcast, the Western Bowhunter podcast. And if you want to hear more about stick bows and more about mule deer and, and uh, other guests and topics, then, uh, you know, tune into that one. But um, aside from that, I mean, everyone, I'm sure, is uh, as excited and eager as I am with the draw results out. And everyone's kind of got their plans getting finalized and, you know, a lot of physical fitness preparation going on. And, uh, maybe a few last minute gear purchases. And, and I'm, I tell you, I'm, I think five weeks out from Nevada and I'm just, I'm so antsy. I can't, uh, I can't believe it. Shoot until my fingers feel like they're going to fall off. And <laughs> I saw those groups you posted the other day, but baseball size groups at like five spot. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting dialed in and, and, uh, I can't, I can't wait. I'm, I'm hoping that I can maintain that kind of shooting, you know, as I roll into the season here and I'm not suffering from some of those can't shoot my way out of a wet paper bag syndromes. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I, I really appreciate your time coming on to the podcast, especially short notice and everything. I mean, um, it, it's been a real honor and pleasure having you on here and, and I've been wanting to talk and meet you for a long time. So, uh, Hey, it's my pleasure, man. Hopefully one of these days we get to meet in person, shake hands. Oh, absolutely. So, um, if you guys check him out and, um, I'm sure we'll have you on again in the future to talk more about trad bows and stuff. So until then I'll just see you on the next one, I guess. Sounds great, man. All right. Thanks, Sal. No sweat. All right. Bye. Well, guys, that's it for this episode. I really appreciate you all tuning in. It was a great episode. Thank you, South, for, for dropping a lot of knowledge and wisdom with us. You can just hear all the little things that he does, guys, that makes a successful hunt or a successful stock. And just basically all the trials and errors, he's throwing it, that at you and, and helping your learning curve get sped up. So when he comes out with this DVD that he was talking about, buy that thing if you're wanting to learn because I guarantee you, Having a guy like that on film that has all this experience and all this track record of proven success and being able to watch that, you're going to learn a ton. Where is he shooting these bucks from? What time of day? What kind of terrain? You're going to see all that in the video that you don't get with the podcast. So be sure to check that out. I will put the link in the show notes as always. And then be sure to leave a five-star review with a comment. Get entered in these cool giveaways that I do. Love hearing what you guys have to say. And outside of that, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.